Hey everyone, Spotty from Spuds Games. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video, I'm gonna be showcasing one of the rarer Commodore monitors you can find, the Commodore 1960. Let's go. So just a little bit of a background on this particular monitor that I picked up. I actually picked up two of them in the same bundle. They were spread over different days. Essentially, the guy was unpacking, or he was actually packing up his unit, and he had stuff everywhere. So initially, the first pickup was for a loose one of these. Um, and he said, oh, I've got the box somewhere. I'll, I'll ring you when I get to it because it's behind some stuff. I think there's another old CRT in there. You could probably have that as well. So anyway, I picked up the first one. It had some issues in regards to the brightness. The brightness pot didn't work, so it was really bright. So I had to turn the G2 down or the screen voltage down. Uh, to accommodate that pot because I really couldn't be bothered opening up and, uh, and fixing it. But then the guy messaged me and said, hey, I found that box for the one you've got. Uh, and funny enough, there's actually another Commodore 1960 inside it. You can you might as well just have that. I haven't tested it. Um, so you just come pick the box up and you can have that monitor as well. As well as, you know, a plethora of uh, N64 and some other stuff. I think there was an Atari Lynx in there as well. So I went and picked this up and yeah, sure enough, the box was there, the monitor was in there, and also we had the foam as well. So what makes this monitor so special and so sought after and rare, I suppose? One, there weren't a lot sold in Australia. So worldwide, they might not have been as rare. I think the Commodore 1960 was European and the Commodore 1950 was the US version of it. Uh, but yeah, in Australia, there wasn't a lot of them sold. So to find two of them, uh, it was quite rare. Another reason why this is quite rare and sought after is this is actually a tri-sync monitor. It's a multi-sync tri-sync. Uh, it has uh, three, I suppose, sync regions that it can that it can sync to. One is RGBS, so your standard Amiga uh, and all your old 240p gaming consoles, or most of them, uh, can uh, output RGBS. Uh, it can also do CGA, so your older IBM stuff, old PC stuff. Uh, and also it can actually output VGA as well. Actually, it's SVGA. It goes right up to 800 by 600. So let's go for a deep dive. First up, we'll notice on the, uh, the front panel here, we've got three dials, which are vertical center, vertical size, and H phase. Over here, we have a button for vertical size. You can set that to auto or manual. And over here, we have the width which you can, I believe is ADD is add or normal. So add to width to it or normal. Um, it could stand for adjustable. Hang on, we'll go for the manual and I'll work that out. Then we've got our standard dials here underneath. They're just, um, if I go up underneath here, rotary dials or pots. Got brightness, contrast, and then we have a power button, which is just a rocker switch type latching uh, power button. As we come around the side, you'll notice that they're are no slots here for speakers. Okay, the monitor itself is quite deep, just a little bit deeper than the, um, the 1084. And then we move around the back. So as we move around the back, you can see the model number there, Commodore 1960. And then we come down, we've got where the uh, cable plugs in, the VGA or the multi-sync cable plugs in, as well as your standard kettle cord power plug so we'll just walk around to the other side and once again I mean it's just exactly the same as the other side no speakers etc but overall it's a nice clean monitor so what I'll do is I'll take the back off and we'll have a look inside so to undo the back there's two screws here Phillips just fit in a Phillips head screws it is quite long in, into there so make sure you do have a long Phillips head screwdriver or screwdriver bit um, and then to remove the other screws, you actually need to flip this on its face, take the bottom off, and then access them from underneath, which I'll do now. Access the other two screws. I was I want to speak before you have to take the base off. You actually don't have to take the base off. They're actually located inside these little feet here. So these feet would be used if you didn't have this swivel base. Uh, but it's pretty easy to take the swivel base off. I'll see if I can do this one-handed. It's just a matter of pulling this latch forward, like that. And then I think you've just got to release it upwards. So let's just see if I can do that without there we go which releases there and that gives us access to those two screws so I'll go ahead and pull those two screws out and then we'll get the cover off so here we are we've now got the back off uh, over this side we've obviously got the the power section and don't worry I haven't powered this up this morning so you know, I'll go stick my hands in there I should be right we've got the power section 
Over this side, we've got obviously the deflection section. I'll just move out the light there uh, with the flyback. And the flyback's quite chunky, um, as well as then we've got sort of, sort of more deflection in there, as well as then we've got the front here. Where we've got um, all the controls. And then we've also got some pots along here to do further adjustments to our geometry if we needed to. Moving around. So it's actually pretty clean inside this one. And the tube itself is a Panasonic tube. I'm not going to read out the model number there, but obviously you can see there. And that's a little bit different to what we're used to with Commodore monitors. Usually, I'm used to seeing Philips tubes in them. Um, but yeah, this one has a Panasonic tube in it. One thing I will note that I've sort of, when I open this up, I'm quite surprised at the lack of electronics there for being a tri-sync monitor. But, you know, as long as it works, I suppose, that's the main thing. Now what I'll show you is the repair that I had to do straight away to this to stop the smoke coming out. And it was a bit of an unusual repair, but to do that, I've got to get access to where all the solder joints are. And to do that, I need to remove this shield here. Now, thankfully, it's quite easy. I think it's only one, there's only four screws, and then that just comes away. So I'll take that off now, which will give me access to all the joints underneath, and I'll show you the repair I had to do. So here we are, we now have access to underneath. One thing I will say, if you ever get one of these monitors, pull it off and have a look. Um, there is a lot of, and I haven't done this, I didn't do it straight away. There's a lot of residual flux and whatnot along here. And this, doing research, does suffer. This model does suffer from, um, from solder joints. But what I'll do is I'll focus in on this section here. You'll see here there's a nice size, shiny, solder blob there now what happened was if i just come around this side this is the part here in question hopefully you guys can see that it's this white um coil here and that's found on most crts i think it's the horizontal something coil not sure of the exact name of it but um yeah it's just a bit of copper wound around and what was happening is i'll just come back around this side that uh solder joint on there and i'll put up some photos was actually burnt out in there had become cold and loose and over time the arcing and sparking from that loose joint actually ne nearly wore away the whole solder pad um, and right next to it is the ground so it actually started tracking over to the ground um, and it was causing all sorts of problems and smoke started coming out i actually couldn't was looking for the smoke coming from the top here one of the capacitors i was expecting it from the smoke was actually coming up through one of these holes and that's how I managed to flip it over and find where the problem was. And it was quite a big burn mark. So now we've had a look at the back, let's give it a run through. We'll test it with the Amiga. Now I don't have a CGA source, unfortunately. So, oh, I do, but I don't have the CGA adapter. Uh, and it means I've got to pull graphics cards out of my old um, computers and whatnot and swap them over with CGA cards, which I don't really want to do. But you can assume if it works with RGBS and it works with SVGA, then it's going to work with CGA, no worries. Um, so before we turn it on, just a couple of things in regards to the specifications. And I'll throw the specification page up now. But essentially, you can do up to 1024 by 768 with SVGA as long as it's interlaced. If it's not interlaced, then it has to stop at 800 by 600. Uh, the dot pitch is 0.28 mil, which is quite a high resolution monitor. Um, and you know, it only weighs in at 14 kilos, which is quite surprising because I thought it might have been a bit heavier than that. So it's definitely heavier than the 1084, which comes in at about 10 kilos. Um, but 14 kilos, it's certainly not too heavy at all. So guys, let's give it a test. First of all, we'll test it with the Amiga. Now I have already turned the Amiga on, so it's producing a signal. I'll just turn the monitor on and you'll hear it hopefully maybe click in. It does take a little minute to warm up, but there we go. So we've got a picture there on screen. Ignore this uh, line over here that you can see. Um, that's just a shadow from the from the um, key light that I've got. It's kind of shining at an angle at the moment. But uh, looking up close, I'll see if I can zoom in there a little bit more for you guys. You know, it's it's a pretty good picture quality. Um, you know, it's nice and bright. The brightness buttons work, as you can see there. You can adjust that quite easily. Uh, contrast works as well. Now you'll see what impact it has here when I use those um, auto buttons, so to speak. So we had initially the auto V size and manual. So that's manual, that's automatic. So in the automatic mode, 
I shouldn't be able to adjust the V size, which I can't. In the manual mode, it will give me access to be able to adjust that V size if I need to. And then we'll talk about the horizontal width as well. So it does shrink the picture in and that actually gets it a little bit brighter as well. So all depends on what you like. I mean, I don't like those bars there. Um, and I'm assuming it might have to do with the different types of um, signals that it gets. But I don't think I should be able, well, H phase will actually do side to side. So um, I just leave it on the ADD, which is um, like an automatic setting. So another thing just to quickly note is there's no manual switch for the different signals. There's no VGA, CGA, RGBS switch. Everything is detected by the monitor and switched accordingly automatically. So what I'll do now is I'll go and grab my Windows 98 PC. Hopefully it still works. Haven't fired it up in a while. And we'll give it a test using SVGA. Uh, I'll use the Windows 98 with the, with the I suppose, a bit, little bit more advanced graphics card. I think it's got a Voodoo in it. Uh, it just gives me multiple resolutions up to, it obviously can do more than 800 by 600, but it's much easier to me, for me to select that in Windows. My other one is a DOS machine and it doesn't have Windows on it. And therefore I've got to select different games with different resolutions. So I'll throw the Windows 98 machine in there and we'll do a few different settings and uh, we'll see how it looks. So I've set the Windows 98 machine up now. Um, I'm not going to get into Windows because I have a few syncing issues with Windows in regards to flicking between different resolutions. Whenever I try to change the resolution, it would actually glitch out the, the monitor and, and have a bit of a hissy fit. So, but what, one workaround, I suppose, I sh to show you guys that it does actually do different um, resolutions. I've jumped into DOS and I've um, loaded up a game called Redneck Rampage. Now, what I can do is I can jump into setup. And what I'll do is I'll run it in 640 by 480 to start with. So I've just changed the resolution to 640 by 480. You know, you can see there that it's it's playing fine. You know, no worries there. What I'll do is I'll just get out of this. And you can I'll just quit this. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll just run setup again. And this time I'll change the resolution to 800 by 600. And I'll save and launch. And once again, it's, it's playing fine. Now I can tell already that, that uh, yeah, the, the graphics are better than what it was at 640 by 480. Um, so it definitely has changed its resolution there. I'm not sure why it Windows would glitch out when it did try and change the resolution. Um, even when I restarted in that same resolution, 800 by 600, it just wouldn't, wouldn't see it. So maybe it's the number of colors it had to set to or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but in DOS, it tends to do it fine. I'll just see if this works in 1024 by 768. It may just revert it back to 640 by 480 because the manual does say it supports that resolution but only interlaced. So we'll see. Save and launch. So far, so good. Let's have a look at the menu. It's a bit hard to tell from there. Yeah, you can kind of see it's. So if I adjust it, maybe if I can adjust it. Um, if I flick it to auto, then it's not too bad. It does work. So yeah, it can do. I've just what I did there was I just flicked it um, to normal on the width for. Uh, the, the higher resolution, 1024 by 768, it does have a couple of bars either side. But if I didn't do that, it, it's way over to the left and I can't actually adjust it. It won't let me adjust that. So um, even if, yeah, no, that won't work. So I have to change it back to normal. You know, if I could put up with the bars on the side, then it will play it. It's just not, I suppose, ideal. Um, so kind of 
yeah, 800 by 600 is where it's at. If you wanted to go to a higher resolution, you can, but it doesn't obviously do it very well. So um, there you go. It just, I suppose, shows that it uh, does work in multiple resolutions over uh, SVGA. So there we are, guys. Thanks for watching. Um, you know, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's it's not often, well, I've never come across this monitor except for that one pickup. Um, never really even knew it existed except when the guy messaged me or I messaged the guy and he said, you know, it's a Commodore 1960. I had to do some research to find out actually what it was. Um, but, you know, really pleased I managed to pick it up. So, yeah, I not only got one, I got two of them, which is even better. So, uh, but to have one boxed manual foam, you know, those adapters, you know, you know, it's highly sought after stuff, especially from the Commodore community. So anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. And until the next one, I'll see you then.